Soundcast. This is a Village Soundcast Network original production. Welcome to Lends Me Your Ears. I'm Stephen Cook, arts reporter for the Chronicle Herald here in Halifax. I'm Karsten Knox, a blogger at Flaw on the Iris at HalifaxBloggers.ca and the movie guru at CTV Morning Live. This is a movie podcast where we look at some current films and then examine some older titles that might be tangentially related and hopefully you'll learn something about some films you might not have seen before. This week with Spongebob and Hot Tub Time Machine 2 in cinemas, we take a look back at time travel movies. You know what? I tried to think back, even though I only saw it a week ago, the Spongebob movie, and so much of it has vanished from my <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the proper... Uh... <laughs> Uh, I mean, we can. We, there's a squid. Yeah. <laughs> some Krabby Patties. <laughs> yeah. There's some time travel in there somewhere. Post apocalyptic nightmare yeah. for kids. <laughs> well, maybe we should just start by saying that this is a podcast about time travel movies today. Yeah. And uh, we thought a while about time travel movies as a particular subgenre, and there are a lot of them, more than I thought. And and it's not just like action science fiction movies. These are these are uh, you know they explore romance and comedy. Um, I got like a little short list here of some that that were familiar to me. Everything from on the romance side is a lake house, time traveler's wife, Kate and Leopold, about time, somewhere in time. Uh, even Groundhog Day is kind of a romantic movie in some ways. Uh, Midnight in Paris and Peggy Sue Got Married. In action, we got 12 Monkeys, Looper, of course, the Terminator movies and, and Star Trek, various Star Trek movies. Uh, X-Men Days of Future Past, which was a big one last year. Time Cop, Source Code, and The Final Countdown, which actually I wouldn't mind talking about a sure. little bit. I, I watched it recently. Uh, in a thriller sort of slash horror, we've got Primer, The Butterfly Effect, Philadelphia Experiment, Project Almanac, which is a new one that's out now in theaters, Time Crimes and Time After Time, and then Comedy, both of the Bill and Ted movies, both The Excellent Adventure and The Bogus Journey. Uh, the, <laughs> I get the Bogus Journey. <laughs> the, uh, the Back to the Future movies, of course, which I think may be the most well-known prominent time travel movies of all time. Sure, and one of, one of the best uh, trilogies yeah. of all time. Very unusual that it just goes into a pure Western at the yeah. end for Whatever, because Bob Zemeckis always wanted to make a Western. Well, there you go, yeah. Time travel is a good excuse. Uh, and and Sleeper, uh, the Woody Allen time travel movies, his second time travel movie, you think about uh, Midnight in Paris being another one. Uh, the Hot Tub Time Machine, the second of which opens February 20th. And uh, Austin Powers, A Spy Who Shagged Me, and Time Bandits, of course, Terry Gilliam. So, I mean, those are just ones that, that came to, you know, to jump jump to my head and there are, are there a bunch more but uh, I, I think maybe we could talk a little bit about what it is about time travel movies that it makes them so appealing why why do we keep seeing them well of course i i guess it goes back to hg wells and the time machine kind of the first real book of note to even play around with that topic and uh put forth the idea that you could uh you know before einstein came along with his theory of relativity that that, that time was something that wasn't just straightforward that you live in from day to day, that it's something that could be played around with, messed with, um, you know, going forwards and backwards. And yeah, it's just it's just an and it's an appealing concept. Uh, the, the fact that, you know, you, rather than being stuck in your current uh, minute by minute, second by second existence, that there's a way to uh, to alter reality. And, and, and that it, it, the idea that it could just be beyond your th- fingertips, that it's maybe just a weird scientifically altered phone booth <laughs> or, or, or something that there'd be some, some simple way or, 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 po- take, or a police box. If or, you're a, a doctor police who, box if you're doctor who yeah. or, or taking a long nap. If you're Christopher Reeve in, in, uh, somewhere <laughs> in time. time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that, uh, uh, that particular story, which of course was made into a film in 1960, which may be the granddaddy of sci- of, mm. of time travel movies, uh, but he it, it, it goes forward in time, way forward in time, and and we when thinking about these these movies. It's that's the that's an unusual thing. I mean, most of the time these movies are about going backwards and changing something that happened in the past, and then the the paradoxes that are created as a result of that, and how how the world could be different if you go back and change things. Uh, so I, I think that's that may be the most appealing part of time travel movies is that that idea of like change mistakes that have been made and and see what the world is like as a result of those changes. Uh, whereas going into the future is is a much dicier proposition. And, and there are fewer stories that are about that. 
Yeah, it's weird. Well, we got Planet of the Apes, I guess, would be a, a really oh, good yeah. example of that. That's true. You know, uh, of course, until it's rev- you know, we don't know that it's a time travel movie. Supposedly, <laughs> I mean, in the you know, in the original one, at least not the first time people saw it. Yeah, that's true. And of course, 1968 it was when the first movie came out. Uh, of course, it's such a classic now that it's kind of everyone knows that that's that's the deal, right? I know everyone's got their damn dirty paws all over it now, <laughs> and then it's no, there's no surprises anymore. You know, everyone knows that there's a Statue of Liberty. Wait, oh, spoiler alert! There's a Statue of Liberty <laughs> yeah, on the beach, uh, waiting somewhere. for him at the beach at the end of the film. Um, it's you know, I guess it, you know, it's, it's when you get into stuff like like the second Back to the Future. Where where it just goes completely haywire. It's all you know. It's like a complete goof on time travel and 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 the idea of, of changing something in the past and then having to go back and fix it. And you know, the, I haven't seen Project Almanac, Project Almanac yet, but I guess that's very key where, where the mistakes kind of create a feedback loop, as you will, if you will, that uh, just gets more and more out of control as these crazy mixed up kids. Uh, you know, they, I don't know what they go to Lollapalooza or something like that. You know, they live out their 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 uh, their adolescent dreams and then of course it all just makes society collapse yes well inevitably <laughs> as inevitably. It would. as do uh you know found footage movies i'm afraid i think i think that's part of the problem right there is found <laughs> i think that just as the genre it's kind of reached its end point maybe with this film <laughs> But yeah, I, I I wanted to talk a little bit about um, about Time Machine just because I I have I revisited it again recently and uh, and Rod Taylor whose work I wasn't super familiar with but uh, but it's funny how sort of poised and English he is coming from the era that he's supposed to come from and then yet later on he becomes this huge action hero in the movie like he gets he goes so far to the the year eight thousand and one or eight thousand and two. And and finds that the human beings are basically cattle at that point. They're very living this this uh, this peaceful lifestyle, but they don't have any spirit at all. These all these young people, and and then they're being basically fed upon by these blue skinned Morlocks who live in the ground uh, and take care of huge machines. All of that seemed a little strange to me. That I mean, not only the Morlocks were eating people, but that they seem although they seem savage, they seem to have the technology to. They had a whole bunch of technology going on, and I didn't understand where where the the spirit of human beings got like leached out of these kids uh, that uh, that that Taylor comes across. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned that because I actually read a piece not too long ago where the writer uh, and now I'm trying to remember where I read it. Maybe it was on the Onion or something, but they were kind of implying that we're already heading for a Morlock Eloy divide. That we've, you know, on the one hand we've got like the kind of jockey bro dude Morlocks and the um, you know kind of ethereal, you know, wayfish hipsters. <laughs> and the, the divide is already happening in our present timeline, wow. as it were. That, 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 in fact, you know, we are... That, that split is already happening. That's some terrifying in our present shit day, right there. Which is pretty, you know... Which is and I, you know, I've 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 you know I've met some pretty Eloy like people in the past. Uh, you know, you look at them the wrong way and they look like they break. And uh, and I say, oh okay, well, geez, they must have had some of those around in a G Wells day too. So yeah, that's possible. Um, sure, you know, I, I I feel like that maybe is coming more true than we'd like. Yeah, a little too early. Yeah, well, fair enough. Um, and I, you know, one of the things I, I liked uh, uh, about the the way that that film handled going to the future was that the time machine didn't move through space. It just move through time right. so as the time is things are changing he's there's this the time lapse which apparently won an academy award yeah well, it was uh, george special, Powell's sp- specialties so. yeah yeah and uh and how he gets to see the fashions change through at least a century anyway or close to a century and all of that was 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 a lot of fun uh, and, and i also i gather that pal had done war of the worlds in advance so he already had a familiarity with wells's material oh for sure he was a big fan of uh it's funny well before he made feature films george pal made these puppet tunes these animated short subjects which are fascinating you know which which kind of paved the way for stuff like gumby uh you know just a decade or so later and then of course uh you know things like nightmare uh before christmas and Coraline and uh-huh. and all those kind of films but um you know it's funny that uh, the ones i've seen don't really visit those kind of science fiction and fantasy sort of subjects they're more, more like movie musicals and little adventure films and that kind of thing he did a couple of dr seuss movies actually oh, before yeah. before a lot of people who knew dr seuss was he uh, he animated uh, a couple of his books oh uh, no kidding yeah uh, to think i saw it on mulberry street uh, he did a cartoon of that in the 1940s and uh-huh. uh, the 500 hats of bartholomew cubbin so you know so he, he's had pretty wide-ranging taste wow yeah yeah and they're pretty amazing films that 
pretty much nobody has seen for for decades and decades. But um, you know, he clearly had a had an eye for the fantasy stuff, and you know, and you know, sort of like a parallel to Ray Harryhausen in a way, who also was right. was doing similar things. But Pal, of course, unlike Harryhausen, was kind of like a hired gun for a lot of the time, working on other people's productions. Pal was right. totally in control, and uh, yeah, obviously with Rod Taylor, uh, you know, he needed a leading man who like you say, could come across as a distinguished man of science, but also mm. could be the two-fisted action guy later. And um, most people know him from two films, that, that and uh, The Birds, pretty much. But oh, right, he, of but course. But, you know, he was came from Australia, had a long, distinguished career, uh, passed away only recently, um, and, uh, you know, was kind of the two-fisted Australian guy you'd expect him to be. Wow. The, from from all reports, you know, and, and uh, you know, at some point he just kind of gave up on Hollywood, went back to Australia, but... Um, there's some other fine films that he's in that maybe don't get as much attention as, as those two particular titles do. That's right. For sure. Right. Well, I mean, I, I really enjoyed his performance here mm. and, and, uh, uh, you know, and how aghast he is when, when he first, he sees this, this new Eden with these, uh, these, all these blonde people. Interesting that they were all blonde <laughs> too. You know, I had he, a lot of questions when, <laughs> when he's wandering around that, this future world. Me, Mew and her, and her friends. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and how, and when the, the siren sounds, they all just kind of strike roll right into the gaping maw of the darkness where they're all going to be consumed by the Morlocks. And they, and they, they, you know, no one really explains why they feel compelled to do this. It just is what people do. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, it's a creepy, uh, Uncle it's a creepy Morlock moment. wants you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of, of time, uh, travel movies that that travel into the future. Uh, the, obviously, Sleeper was one. Was there other ones that you had thought of, Stephen? That uh... well, there's a couple. Well, the, the Sleeper has this weird antecedent uh, in in this uh, film from like 1930, 31. It's called Just Imagine. It's basically the same storyline, although it's it's a uh, Fox film. It stars a comedian named L. Brendel, who was, uh, I believe, of Swedish descent, and that was kind of his shtick. Was uh, you know speaking with the kind of uper Swedish immigrant accent. And he, you know, f- falls asleep or winds up in a meat locker. I can't remember which one winds up in a futuristic society, but it's 1930s style. So everything's art deco, kind of like a, a dumbed down version of Metropolis and, uh, and there's musical numbers and then, and that sort of thing. So, you know, it, it wasn't a new concept then really. I, and I guess maybe it's just kind of a take on the Rip Van Winkle kind sure. of idea, you know, fall asleep for a hundred years and, and you've got a story, you know, only Rip Van Winkle had, uh, I think gnomes who went bowling. I think was, it was the big, <laughs> okay. the big futuristic uh, draw there. But um, you know, so 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 it's not as opposed a, to the orgasmatron. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no, Washington Irving never never had that kind of foresight. He, he there you go. Uh, the, the headless horseman throwing pumpkins. Yes, orgasmatron. No, no. Okay, so, <laughs> get away uh, to go. There you go. So uh, of the other movies that are um that are out now uh and this is one that just arrived on on VOD and DVD and Blu-ray uh, Predestination which is one I think people should seek out speaking of Australians uh because it's an Australian film and uh, uh though it's very much you know set in in an America of the of the past uh but uh, people travel forward and backwards in in the film in terms of these, these sort of temporal agents it's based on a, uh, a Robert Heinlein short story which when I was a kid I read a lot of Heinlein and uh, this was one of my favorite stories of his I remember reading it and just kind of having one of those like uh, brain explosion moments where I was just like, <laughs> I could see that happening. That this this is the best time travel story ever, and wouldn't this be make an awesome movie? But how could you do it? Because it's very brief. The whole the whole story is thirteen pages long, and uh, but it, it has just such a great twist. It's it's and Heinlein basically uh, sells it by making it a bit tongue in cheek. Like the whole thing is kind of it's a little bit of body humor which is surprising given that it was written in 1958 or published in 58 uh but uh the um uh the the uh, uh directors the Sperig brothers am i pronouncing their names right i think Sperig Sperig sounds good to me <laughs> yeah these guys did daybreakers so they know about sci-fi fantasy material and uh uh this uh, they've done a very serious take on this like they they made it very much about identity and about sexual politics in a way that really like i think they did a pretty good job i don't know what did you think well, well you hit me to this film and and i i wasn't aware of it but as soon as you told me it was from the guys who made daybreakers i was in because i loved that movie i thought it was one of the better vampire movies of the last uh, decade or so yeah. and uh you know I, I thought okay well they clearly have a handle on 
how to take something we've seen before and and make it fresh and uh you know, even though, it, yeah, it's funny you mentioned it's shot in Australia, but I don't think you hear a single Australian accent except maybe when Noah Taylor shows up. But right, <laughs> uh, partway through the film is is kind of the the head of this uh, this bureau that's uh, sending people back in time to fix things and uh, prevent disasters and that sort of thing. But of course, um, so the film is already aware of all the time travel cliches of like going back and you know to kill Hitler or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, all these things we've seen people attempt to do or, or make fun of or whatever over the years. So, so they already know all the, the things we'd expect to, to see. So then they play around with that and then, you know, they create this really well thought out Mobius loop basically. Yeah. Of, uh, and it, you know, you, you kind of have to think about it after the fact, like did that, re- okay, that led to that. And, you know, and then, you know, they jokingly, how, at one point, somebody plays "I'm my own grandpa" on the yeah. ju- jukebox, which is like a pretty, pretty obvious giveaway as to what we're about to see. But, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it, it doesn't. You know, to a lot of people, if they don't know the song, it's probably not going to resonate. But it's in the it's in the uh, in the story too. Oh, well, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that was a nice thing to add to the uh, the film version. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, Ethan Hawke plays the barkeep, and Sarah Snook, who is an Aussie a- actor, she plays the unmarried mother character. And uh, yeah, I mean. It's, it starts with uh, this dude going into this bar in the in New York in the early '70s and telling his life story to the barkeep, and it's the story starts with when I was a little girl. So so already you're getting a sense of this person having had a different identity at one, some point, and uh, you know, and there's a lot of the characters a lot of pain, and I was surprised at how much intensity and emotional intensity there was in a genre picture like that. Oh, definitely, especially when you realize what the connections actually are as it as it goes along. It just it's like wow. And you think about what you would do in a similar situation if, you know, it's it's weird. It's really hard to talk about without completely without, ruining. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, yeah, and it's funny. It's, you know, like a, a Mobius loop is literally a twist. Um, but this is like a twist that keeps twisting, like <laughs> like a screw almost. It keeps going through as as we go along, and it just keeps spiraling in on itself but in in a, in a very clever way and and Ethan Hawke um who's an actor I can be hot and cold on but he's completely believable here really sells yeah, it I, absolutely um I'm not even sure what my anti hawk bias is cuz I I can't think of the last time I was really annoyed by him in anything but no but at the beginning of his career I totally feel I know what you're talking about yeah, cuz when he started uh he was served up as kind of a greasy haired sort of like uh, you know, uh, uh, teen idol almost in a way. Yeah. Circa reality bites, and I really didn't like him at all. Yeah, I, I guess maybe the early angry young man kind of yeah. thing that he was doing. But uh, since since he's worked with R- uh, Richard Linklater, I think he's become he's kind of leaps and bounds. I I really like him. Now. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think maybe the purge might have sustained a little bit of those old feelings. <laughs> Fair enough. But but certainly the Linklater films that he's been in have, have been wonderful, and uh, and he's he's great here. As, as a, you know, he he's just got a way. He's got the hangdog kind of face now. I think he's kind of grown into it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he can express a lot more with with just his you know expressions and body language than than maybe early on. Yeah, I, I totally I totally agree, and I like the choices he's making with his career. Uh, obviously, having worked with these guys before, he knows he, he's he's not afraid of of trying out some fantasy material that's intellectual, and and this is that's exactly what this is. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I just like that there's some political resonance, and I like the fact that in fact I went back and reread the the short story, and there's an element about a uh, a bomber. A bomb that goes off in New York City, and uh, and the, the, they're trying to track this guy down. Some of these agents, and that's not in the original story. So they they added this added. There's an extra layer of of Mobius loop that goes on with the identity of the bomber that is particular to the film and not to the original story. Yeah, I guess, I guess it just adds an extra bit of uh, suspense, maybe. Uh, although, the, thankfully, the whole bomb thing doesn't isn't as crucial to the story as, as it might be in a different, you know, there are no shots of the, the timer winding down or, you know, no, <laughs> yeah. en- no endless, you know, digital clock counting down kind of stuff or a race against time. Although, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of, this is kind of like a relay through time, <laughs> <than a> race <laughs> against time. but, but it's, you know, it's there to, to make you think that it might appear. And then of course they kind of pull the rug out of from under you by not resorting to that, uh, that cliche. The, the, the bomb thing was the one thing that was kind of like, 
I don't know how this plays. So I, I haven't read the short story. So knowing that it wasn't in the original short story makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think it adds the suspense and a little more. Yeah. There's more at stake, I guess, than just the characters and their relationship to one another. Yeah, it makes it more filmy. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> more and and so that's yeah, predestination is, and that's out right now uh, for those of us uh, who are. I mean, I'm not sure what sort of. Uh, a release it might get in cinemas beyond uh, where we live, but uh, but it's available for those who are interested and want to see some more time travel movies. Um, also out right now is uh, Spon- the SpongeBob <laughs> movie, A Sponge Out of Water. Now, this is one that you turned me on to. I am not a fan of I don't know how it turned material. on. Uh, <laughs> I count here. But. I, I, uh, I, I, but you had said it had time travel in it, and I was like, well, okay, I guess I've got to give this thing a, a, a try. And so I went to see it, and this was about a week ago. And you know how some movies like stay in your head and they're they're really they really have a a lot of emotional weight well i walked out of this and i think within a day i'd forgotten most of the plot and that's not to say that it isn't an incredible plot it may be the most outrageous plotted story that i can have seen uh, <laughs> certainly like for a kids movie yeah absolutely <laughs> uh but uh but i couldn't relay it at this point like I, it's all just gone yeah it's it's uh cinematic candy floss for sure like yeah. uh it's uh you know, I'm I'm trying to piece it together in my head, um, and it's 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 really not you know it's not meant to be taken seriously. I mean, that's part of the appeal of uh, the series. I, I think SpongeBob is like you know it's such a delightful throwback to the old Looney Tunes, Warner Brothers cartoons, and and Rocky and Bullwinkle and stuff like that. That um, you know that it's prime. It, it, there's there's no lesson to be learned here. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know yeah. it's 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 not about learning to play together nicely or, or you know any of that kind of stuff. That some of it's about teamwork though. They kept throwing that word yeah, into it. That's true. That is true. But but it's it's almost like it's a parody of kids entertainment that uh, yeah. that keeps throwing that in. You know, can we build it? Yes, we can. <laughs> but first, we're going to take you on a psychedelic mind warping time journey. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> and that's that's definitely what it was. But I also noticed that. That the, the stuff for adults that uh, is is sort of baked into the story. There's the Mad Max reference when uh, Bikini Bottom goes crazy, post-apocalyptic, just like that. Everyone yeah, starts instantly. wearing leather <laughs> and spikes and mohawks instantly, yeah, yeah, and everything's everything's on fire under the sea. Uh, and then, of course, there's a shining. At one point, there are the two two like little little girl characters who say come and play with me which is just right out of the shining i i, I made i sort of made a mental note of those i'm sure there are others but those yeah, are the ones it's that bizarre all the r-rated movie references that kind of pop <laughs> yeah. up in spongebob like like it, it i you know on so many levels i think it's a truly subversive kid show in a way that kids entertainment has been trying to get away from mm-hmm. uh it's certainly on, on television now m- mind you i once uh i once drove from uh, ottawa to halifax in a minivan with my uh my sister's three kids, and they had SpongeBob on their little portable DVD player, and that got a bit tiresome. An hour and a half tops, I think, was right. good for SpongeBob, but you Fair know, enough. The, there's only so much uh, you can take, and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, at, at least in a movie theater, you have an option of running to the bathroom. But when you're driving a minivan, uh, you're kind yeah. of stuck. You're kind of trapped there with that. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to say that some of my favorite parts of it were the time travel elements. The 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 idea is that this formula for this very delicious uh, the Krabby Patty, this burger has, has gone missing and uh they come up with this plan, SpongeBob and um one of the characters. Uh, oh, Patrick, the the starfish is Patrick, or or his his nemesis, who turns out to be Plankton. Plankton, Plankton, because Plankton has a computer wife whose name is Karen, uh, <laughs> and, and she's smart enough to figure out how to go back through time in order to to get the formula in advance of it being stolen. Uh, unfortunately, of course, things don't quite quite go as well as they hoped. In fact, they do go forward in time, and they meet uh, a porpoise at the end of the universe who's in charge of everything and watching <laughs> so apparently, everything. Apparently, God is a dolphin. And- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the clever thing is that, like, SpongeBob and his friends are all kind of traditional hand-drawn style Saturday morning animation. Uh, the, do- the dolphin is stop motion. Like, he's mm-hmm. clearly a three-dimensional stop motion dolphin puppet. And then at some point, uh, the dolphin, or the, the, they're, they're able to um, sort of alter the the script of the movie in a way almost i mean they they changed the fairy tale that every, it's supposed to be transcribed you know uh, unfolding as we watch the film and they, they give themselves superpowers and they turn into three-dimensional computer animated characters in the real world of you know actual 
photographed people um, as they do battle with uh, the evil burger beard played by Antonio Banderas. Antonio Banderas just chews up the, the the scenery and the seashells and everything in sight. But. He is he is so terrific. You know, every once in a while he'll show up in something, and I'm just like, man, this guy is really he's really game. He totally commits in a way that I really <laughs> uh, I really admire about him. Yeah, I, I thought maybe he's just going to coast on Puss in Boots voiceovers for the rest of his career, and, <laughs> and that'd be fine. You know, yeah, there's yeah. probably enough money in, in that to, to keep him going. But, but it's yeah, it's been a while since he's done anything really like fun, and um, you know, maybe a little outre for him or whatever. You know, like I just remember when he when he you know when he when he came to Hollywood after seeing him in all his Almodovar films and just really enjoying him and things like Matador and and so on. And then he came to Hollywood and got stuck in these horrible romantic comedies and forgettable action films. It's like, oh, I wish, you know, I re- you know, like this is sort of, you know, like Chow Yun-Fat came to Hollywood and made terrible movies. And, yeah. You know, he went back to Hong Kong and um, we haven't seen him again since. But, um, you know, at least, you know, Antonio's hanging in there and hope, so there's hope that we'll see him in some better projects down the road. And, and maybe this is slumming for him. I don't know. But he seemed to be having fun doing yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think I think it's great. And, uh, and I think it's kind of interesting that he is a stepfather of the woman who is ma- becoming an instant <laughs> star overnight um, in uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> it's a kind of this, the Hollywood connections kind of make my make my head. Which is spin. a whole other time of retrogressive time travel that <laughs> yeah, we're not going right. to get into. But. No, maybe on another <laughs> another podcast. Uh, <laughs> One of the films that uh, that I I revisited uh, preparing for for talking with you, with you today, uh, Stephen, in, in our inaugural uh, um, uh, podcast movie podcast here is uh, the Final Countdown from 1980, uh, and I remembered it when I was a kid as being a super exciting action movie. Uh, and so watching it again, I realized that it's not actually all that super exciting. <laughs> but but the first, I would even say the first half is basically pure jet porn recruitment video stuff. It's, you know, the USS Nimitz is sailing off the coast of Hawaii and it's nothing but jets taking off and jets landing and off and landing <laughs> back so, and forth. So it's the template for Top Gun is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, you've got Kirk Douglas on the bridge as Captain Yellen. He's in control and yelling a lot. Uh, and uh, and all of a sudden, this strange psychedelic storm shows up, and they're back in uh, December 6, 1941, and they, the ship rescues a, a yacht that has been uh, attacked by Japanese Zeros, and uh, the, the crew of the yacht, uh, a senator, played by Charles, Charles Durning, and what they used to call a secretary, uh, Catherine Ross, uh, as well as the Zero pilot who got shot down by the F-14 Tomcats. So they all get brought on, on the ship, but are, are kind of, you know, tried they try to keep them in the dark about what the hell's going on. And I gotta ask, does Charles Durning do a little sidestep at any point in the course? He, he might, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he might. Uh, the, the, the excised musical number from uh, Final Countdown. <laughs> <laughs> is is he a big musical guy? I didn't even well, know. Well, uh, uh, he was in Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Ah, uh, right. It was the the governor who did this, this. The best number in the whole movie for me is when he does the little dance through the Capitol. Okay. In, in, in Texas in Austin. Well, that's the, definitely this era. A uh, versatile actor, know. shall we yeah, say. Yeah, well, he plays, a, he plays a politician in this, too. He's, he's a senator who, uh, according to history anyway... Uh, uh, James Farentino plays Commander Owens, uh, this guy who is writing a book about the history. Uh, very handy to have on board the Nimitz, someone who knows all about <laughs> World War II and uh, and the uh, you know the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. So so he realizes that the senator was lost at sea right before the attack, and uh, of course they save him. So they're already changing the timeline uh, when they go back, and they don't try to really explain why it is they got sucked back in time. It just happened, and now they have to deal with it. So so for the first first half of the movie not much happens and all of a sudden you've got about 20 minutes where the characters all stuck in a room going what are we going to do about the fact that we're in <laughs> where we could change we could change a lot of things here and there and each of the characters has a pretty good argument for what it is that they think they should do one is you know we can't do anything because we know what's going on martin sheen plays a guy named lasky who is a uh, uh he's a civilian uh, consultant who's been brought on the ship for this one cruise and uh, i guess i don't know if uh, aircraft carriers do they say cruises with aircraft carriers but anyway they, they go they cruise they cruise point. yeah Cruising speed yeah yeah so uh <laughs> so they go so he's he's of the opinion that they shouldn't do anything and uh douglas is like well i am uh the captain and, and I'm going to protect American lives whether I'm in 1941 or 
1981, so this is what I'm going to do, and we're going to attack the uh, the Japanese fleet. And uh, and and then uh, and then there's a great scene where the Zero Captain gets free and he gets his gets a machine gun. And he shoots a bunch of uh, the sailors, and uh, and you know they basically he takes Catherine Ross prisoner. Uh, and it's it's super intense moment where where it's like well all of a sudden things are out of their control and they don't really know what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I found that to be one of the the more interesting parts of of the in terms of it being a time travel movie. There there is it is worth seeing. I mean, all of that other stuff around the ship and the planes, less so. But yeah, yeah I, I haven't actually seen this film since the eighties, so this is all kind of like a flashback. It's like a trip through time for me. So, but uh, you know, like I just uh, and that might have been the first Kirk Douglas movie I ever saw. So I had to say before Spartacus, you know, bef- before. Uh, you know, before seven days in May, <laughs> I think that was my first Kirk Douglas uh, experience. And, um, you know, just you don't get those kind of casts anymore. Really, no. I mean, it, it, it's 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 kind of a, 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 you know, now you could be Liam Neeson in Battleship, I guess. Would be the, <laughs> right. <laughs> the it's probably the aliens, closest. not the Japanese. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, uh, you, know, it, you know, there's just a certain weight and authority to, to those kind of actors um, that, uh, you know, might make this worth a watch at some point for someone to, to just kind of see that kind of old school Hollywood totally um, power, star power inter, intersecting with kind of a modern time travel uh, kind of storyline. So, you know, I, I definitely want to revisit this film at some point. It, it seems like one of those classics, and I, and I just hope I can get the Europe song out of my head when I'm <laughs> you know, This is the problem with this, right? <laughs> it plants that seed. I, I don't know for sure whether the film, the, the song came after the movie, so I don't know if the movie uh, inspired the song, but uh, but there there you go. It, it is it is part of the deal. Uh, one thing I learned, a little bit of trivia about the director named Don Taylor. He, he was an actor. Uh, he starred in Stalag 17, and opposite Spencer Tracy and Father, the original Father of the Bride. Uh, and when he became a director, he directed a couple of sequels, the prominent sequels from the 70s, the Damien the o- Omen 2 oh, and right. one of the Planet of the Apes sequels, I think maybe Escape from the Planet of the Apes. So he, he already knew a little bit about uh, time travel, I guess. Yeah, well, I guess I guess he's a, kind of a journeyman director, good at the genre type stuff. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, you know, n- nothing flashy, just tell the story and get that kind of there, kind of filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that's uh, that's something to to consider for for your your time travel movie uh, brunch or dinner or whatever you want <laughs> if you if you're thinking about doing that. Um, I should also mention I, I neglected to say before uh, when we we're talking about the time machine that was remade in 2002, and when it was remade, it was directed by. Simon Wells, who's the great grandson of H.G. Wells, which I'm sure the marketing department was just thrilled about. You know, I mean, way to sell a movie. It's actually there's a there's actual historic lineage from the original creator to the to the remake, and it, that one starred Guy Pierce and Jeremy Irons. And I I did not revisit it, but I remember it being reasonably. Yeah, reasonably I saw that good. when it came out, and I thought oh. it was pretty. Good. I like Guy Pierce as an actor. Uh, I've been watching some of the TV stuff he's been doing in Australia lately, and um, you know, obviously, you know, instead of stop motion time lapse kind of stuff you know we have a lot more tools at our disposal uh which doesn't always mean for a better film experience but uh from what i remember is fairly tastefully done and uh you know although i wonder is that really hg wells grandson or is it possibly hg wells traveling forward in time to direct the movie <laughs> right based on I, I noticed that the character from the time machine is is h george wells hmm, hmm. hmm. yeah it's very interesting <laughs> So I, I guess this is a good moment, as any, to ask you, Stephen, what your favorite time travel movie is. If any of the ones I've mentioned in my list, or or otherwise. Oh gosh, well, uh, you know, we mentioned Sleeper earlier on, and uh, you know, that's that's there's no device involved, of course. That's the uh, frozen suspended animation yes. thing, yeah. and and of course, which probably inspired Futurama to no small degree. Although the the uh, the first episode of Futurama has a kind of a history going by montage when Fry gets uh, frozen, which is right out of the time machine only with, with a lot of gags interspersed <laughs> throughout it. So, so it's kind of that, you know, that's kind of a homage to both things at the same time. I, I'm, I'm really fond of those uh, Rip Van Winkle kind of storylines, mm-hmm. you know, just uh, the, you know, being alone in the, in the future where you're, 
you're a living museum piece, which yes. is how I feel a lot of the time <laughs> uh, in the present day. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, as someone who still buys CDs and watches movies on uh, on discs. Uh, <laughs> you don't have a laser disc player, do you? I, I do have a laser disc player. I know it's sad. It's like <laughs> there's three movies that you can't get in any other format. You know, it's just uh, it, it's it's a sad window into my existence. So so I have a real fondness for those those kind of storylines. Um, you know, and Sleeper, of course, has lots of great gags, you know, like in the future. It turns out that eating red meat and smoking is good for you. Uh-huh. It turns out, um, you know, that the, there's, a, there's a, a chase scene with a Volkswagen, which is, you know, taken out of a, a museum or is, is thought to be an old relic. And, and, of course, the fact that nobody has sex anymore, they just use their orgasmatrons sure. For, sure. for pleasure. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem too far off the mark. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I like that idea. You know, I, I like I I don't know that I like time travel when it's taken too seriously. Because mm-hmm. um, obviously, you can like you know, Twelve Monkeys takes it very seriously. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, but but it does it because it's Terry Gilliam. It does have that absurd kind yeah. of and time bandits fantasy to it. Time bandits took it a lot less seriously. Oh, for sure. It was yeah. just you know, well, time bandits is like a lot of historical sketches tied together with a child and some dwarves. And uh, but but you you get a chance, you know, to to have Sean Connery play Agamemnon and yeah. John, John Cleese is, uh, I think he plays Robin Hood. I think he's just, mm, yeah. I haven't seen it in a while, but I, you know, I remember this. It's all bizarre. Can Ian Holm is Napoleon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it, it's almost like a sketch movie, but but of course it's, uh, but then it you know just has that really powerful ending. I saw that in the theater. Actually, the old Highland uh, used to be a down at the Armdale Rot- Rotary, uh, now the Roundabout, and uh, you know just being left agape by the end of that film, just yeah. I couldn't believe that you know it would get that dark and and that weird, and uh, you know I, I couldn't wait to see it again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> basically, well, you know it's it strikes me now just thinking about it how many time travel movies. Are, how many science fiction movies are sort of by their vision a time travel movie? Uh, you know, I thought about uh, Interstellar recently, which is a movie I really liked, and and uh, you know they really mess with relativity, and you get to sense of you know characters growing old on Earth while the characters that we're visiting with, who are traveling beyond the stars, staying the same age, and that, that's an interesting kind of twist on the time travel. I mean, that I think that completely qualifies. Yeah, and it also sets it up in such a way that. He can't just directly influence the past. That it's, you know, that it takes great force of will. Yeah. Basically, um, and you know, it's not as simple as just showing up and telling somebody how to make an atomic bomb or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I like that aspect of it. That that there was a code, you know, that had to be deciphered and and another dimension basically mm-hmm. down the road. And and uh, you know, it's it's part of that sort of an homage to two thousand one in a way too. Yeah. Know? Oh, absolutely. Um, so. It, it, a lot of crossroads intersect in, in that uh, in that film and with that ending. Yes. Um, uh, another. Uh, I'm trying to think of another example. I guess Looper uh, is one that uh, manages to have the right amount of fun yeah. with the concept. You sure. know, it's got the the hitman from the future kind of aspect to it, which gives it a, a it's it's almost a pulpier kind of feeling to it and and, and great performances too yeah I agree I think that if I had a problem with Looper it was just trying to imagine that uh, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt would become Bruce Willis even with the like <laughs> prosthetic nose thing like really these guys are the same person uh, but but you know I, I, I yeah I thought it was very clever too I should say, just for the record, that my favorite time travel movie is probably Primer from 2004, maybe Primer. I'm not sure. I've, I've always thought it was Primer, but I've heard people say Primer. Uh, you know, it's. I think it's it's as famous for having been made for seven thousand dollars by its, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, director, writer, actor Shane Carruth, uh, as it is for the story of basically uh, two. Uh, scientists or would-be inventors who stumble upon this technology while trying to do something else. It's funny because the first 20 minutes of the movie are full of jargon that are is mostly indecipherable. You just get a sense these guys are kind of ambitious and are trying to invent something. And the last 20 minutes of the movie are also indecipherable. And I've seen this film maybe six times, and I, I cannot tell you how what happens in the end exactly. Every time I, I know there are charts available online that you can <laughs> you can sort of look and see what might be happening, and, and uh, you know, and I, I'm fine with that. But, but, you know, the thing about the movie that I like so much, despite this, or because of it, probably despite it, uh, is that it gets right this sense of awe and dread 
that something as incredible as time travel would elicit in somebody. You know, about about uh, 45 minutes in, these two guys have figured out they're on to something. They've got something, but they don't understand it. They don't understand what it actually is or what it might be doing to them. Uh, however, they are they are adventurers. They're explorers, and they you know they test them test test their their device themselves by going back um, to earlier the same day and then taking advantage of the. Uh, um, you know, making some money on the stock market, which, you know, I think is a pretty obvious thing to do. Uh, but but of the, course, that's what you would do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, that's what you'd, you do. I mean, that makes a certain amount of sense. But uh, at the same time, you know, the the film doesn't steer clear of the sort of ethical uh, dilemmas that come upon them as they understand how they further understand as they go along, they they further understand the the breadth of the technology that they're using. And uh, and it's it's scary. Like I, I think about that film and about the kind of the way it's, it uses music and image and editing to create a real sense of unease. And I think maybe that's why it's my favorite time travel movie, because it, it does explore some of the, the options for, <laughs> for going back and, and changing uh, things or, or capitalizing on, on what has happened in the near future. But it also it, it has an emotional impact uh, that, that transcends even the weird plotting, you know? Yeah, well, uh, that's the great thing is that it captures that sense of, you know, even though you're not leaving the planet and you might even be going to a time you might be familiar with, even if it's in your own past, you know, you are really stepping into the unknown and uh, the unfamiliar. And, you you know, you're kind of on eggshells because you don't know what, like, what might happen or what you might do or how it might have an effect. Like, I always wonder if, if I went back to the 50s, for example, like, I was like, well, if I could time travel, what would I go? <laughs> you know, and I think, well, it'd be really cool to go see. You know, go see a Beatles concert or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, or, yeah. Um, you know, see see one see an early Elvis show or something like that. Just to, it always seems to be music related for some reason. But but um, you know, or go see Cinerama. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in in Times Square, New York City, or something like that. But you know, I always think, well, you know, when I say the wrong thing and you know, get locked up and. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, you, yeah. Know, when, you had the wrong kind of money. Yeah, so you had the wrong kind of money. You have an identity that doesn't uh, doesn't jive with uh, local records. Yes, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you yeah, know. no, I, I I ask myself the same questions. And usually, if I think about my you know the twentieth century, each decade has something, whether arts related, you know, Jimi Hendrix or uh, or, or you know historical related that I would like to be present for. Um, you know, it's funny. You get back more than like a hundred and seventy years or so, and I start to lose interest. I mean. You know, some uh, do. Do I want to go back to the ancient Egyptians? I'd, probably not, because I I might wind up being a slave, and what good would that be? Catch some horrible disease. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There <laughs> you no go. No cure has been developed for you. Yeah, yeah, I think I think once the pre pre Civil War, I start to wonder. Really, was it was it any better than life mm. life now? I, I don't I don't know. And the Civil um, War was no picnic. No, it From really wasn't. Heard, it's <laughs> yeah. <not> the... <laughs> Yeah, it was... I wish I was at Gettysburg. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you really don't. No, the, where once the uh, the uh, life expectancy gets below my actual age right now, then that's the point where I'm I'm done. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that that pretty much wraps up our our look at time travel movies. Yeah, I, I, I say uh, movies are kind of like time travel in and of itself uh -huh. <laughs> you know, we can revisit the past and uh if you revisit the past when you're watching a movie that they're revisiting the future in uh it's making my brain hurt <laughs> yeah the, then we're getting to bill and ted right there i think <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh a special yeah. guest george carlin here. yay oh. <laughs> go back and see george carlin <laughs> <laughs> I saw him already. Oh, you did? <laughs> go back to see him at the Metro Center. Oh, there Again. you go. There you go. Well, that's been our show. Hope you liked this look at time travel movies. We hope you had a great time, and we'll see you next time. This was a Village Soundcast Network original production.